As we stand at the crossroads of history and mystery, a compelling narrative unfolds. This is the story of pre-Diluvian civilizations, societies that may have flourished in a world before a great deluge swept across the earth. These ancient cultures, shrouded in the mists of time, beckon with a siren's call, promising to reveal secrets about our origins and the true nature of human history. As we embark on this journey, we tread a path lined with myths, legends, and archaeological enigmas, each offering a piece of the puzzle of our forgotten past. In this episode of Ancient Civilizations, courtesy of Gaia, we dive deep into the forgotten past of the human civilization, a past wiped up by the great flood that swept across the Earth. Planet Earth. According to radiometric dating, this planet is roughly 4.5 billion years old. Modern day scholars claim that civilization began roughly between 5,000 and 6,000 years ago. Geological records show that severely erratic weather patterns were present on the planet roughly 12,000 years ago. Countless myths and legends from around the planet depict a time of complete chaos that destroyed all civilizations on the planet. The deluge, the cataclysm, the event, the end of the world. Along with these great fables, ancient sites like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, Easter Island in the South Pacific, South America, Giza Plateau, Japan and India contain a level of sophistication and design that baffles the minds of scholars and scientists. Most of these sacred sites have foundations composed of stones weighing in excess of 30 tons that defy our human understanding. If civilization only happened roughly five to 6,000 years ago, then who built these foundational wonders in pre-Diluvian times that were designed to survive the end of the world? And what were those beings who inhabited the Earth long before the Flood trying to tell us about our connection to the cosmos? We turn to science for answers to help unravel the mystery. But when we look below the surface, the laws of physics appear to have been mastered long before humanity began to figure them out. Science is a living body of information that's not static, it's not fixed. It's designed to be constantly updated. When new discoveries come to light, we've got to incorporate those discoveries into the pre-existing scientific story. We're writing a new story right now. We have to, because the evidence no longer supports the story of the past. The evidence no longer supports the theory that civilization, for example, began between 5,000 and 5,500 years ago. The evidence no longer supports that civilization's rise has been linear, that we began with primitive settlements and, and primitive ways of building society and have gradually come to where we are today in a linear fashion. So when we're thinking about our past, we have to constantly update the story. There is a continuity in the stories that cannot be dismissed. One of those continuities is the story of the Great Flood. This is where our new story begins. So when we're talking pre-Diluvian times, do we mean antediluvian? Because diluvian means the deluge, the Great Flood. And pre, of course, means before. But when we say antediluvian, it is A-N-T-E, as in anterior, in front of, you know, the anterior chain of your body. So when we say antediluvian, it is in front of the great deluge. So when we say pre-diluvian, antediluvian, we know that this is a time period before the great flood. They're one and the same. In the beginning, after a great devastation, according to the Sumerian text, the gods came and manifested humans again. And this is a theme that we see repeated many times in many cultures all over the world, that there was a creation of humans, there was 
a massive flood and the earth was repopulated. You know, that's reflected in the Babylonian text, in the Hebrew text, in the Egyptian text. They all mention something similar. When you do a deep survey into the myths from around the world, you actually find that there are two different flood narratives that happened. And so in the very first flood narrative, it talks about a dark world or a, a beginning and the end of an age. And then there's this cataclysm and this flood occurs and the individual escapes the flood with the seven sages, the seven abigails. And then after that, it is the beginning of this golden age and this new period of time. With the Noah flood, there's civilization that is occurring and the flood happens because they are trying to wipe out the wickedness from on the planet, you know, like you find in the biblical narrative. And Noah survives the flood and there's no mention of these seven sages or seven Abigails. So in South America, we have the tradition of Viracocha, who is a builder god that suddenly shows up mysteriously after a global flood wiped everything out. And he appears in specific locations uh, with a group of seven specialists. They're experts in their fields because wherever civilization appears on the face of the earth after the flood, and is always one charismatic leader who leads seven craftspeople, experts in their field. Throughout the ages in mythology and spiritual traditions, there are several common themes that keep repeating. But the ancient cycles encoded in nature as well as embedded in myth, remind us that if we are to survive on this planet, we must be prepared to change and adapt. There are common themes that run through all of these stories. One of those themes is that civilization is cyclic rather than linear, that there have been previous cycles of civilization that have lasted for approximately 5,000 years, Something happens, those cycles come to an end, a new cycle begins. This is where it gets really interesting because even though the cycles change, there appears to be a continuity of knowledge, a continuity of wisdom when it comes to the end of one cycle and the beginning of the next. The Mayans divided one precession of the equinoxes, a 26,000 year cycle approximately, into five 5,125 year long cycles. Each of those cycles, when they begin, something happens to the civilization during that time. And one of the questions that historians have asked is, could there be something that drives these cycles? Is there a cosmological phenomenon? Is there a climactic phenomenon? Is there a geologic phenomenon? Maybe it's a convergence of all of these phenomena. Something happens every 5,125 years. Well, if we take the year 2012 as the end of one 5,125 year long cycle, and we go back in time to the 5,000 years previously, this would be the time that we traditionally have been taught that civilization began than 5,500 years ago. Now, new discoveries are revealing the remnants of ancient civilizations that predate that 5,000 years many, many times. One of the things that's echoed in the ancient stories around the world, whether it's not it's Plato talking about Atlantis or the ancient Egyptians in the Temple of Sais, is that we find that they discuss how these events have come in many different ways. They discuss how they, the civilizations have been destroyed from periods of great flooding, but also extreme heat and fire. So it's not just about one thing, it's about a totality of all of these different catastrophic events that have led to the disappearance and destruction of these pre-Diluvian civilizations. And the way that we have the telltale evidence is that a lot of these ancient megalithic structures from the pre-Diluvian civilizations that left behind is that we find what's known as vitrification on the surface, whether or not it's Egypt or Peru or Turkey. And what that means is that those granite blocks and the quartz that was in them literally melted from such an extreme heat event that in order to do that, you have to have temperatures on the surface that would have exceeded 2,000 degrees. 
Researchers and mythological heroes on a journey have long looked to the sky for answers to explain what happened in the past. But most spiritual traditions and mythical journeys carry core messages that inspire us to also go within to find our answers. Starting in the early 20th century, scientists have been studying ice core samples from the polar regions of the planet. From 1989 to 1995, the Greenland Ice Core Project conducted experiments to understand the climate patterns in that area for approximately the past 100,000 years. Again in 1998, the collaborative ice drilling project at the Russian Vostok Station in East Antarctica uncovered the deepest ice core ever recorded, revealing climate data for approximately the past 420,000 years. Then, in 2017, an ice core taken from the Blue Ice Field in the Allen Hills of Antarctica revealed ice dating to roughly 2.7 million years old. These studies provide geologists with a clear understanding of the cyclical nature of Earth's climate and weather patterns. Geologists refer to the past and current epochs as the Pleistocene and the Holocene. The Pleistocene epoch began about 2.8 million years ago, and this is the sheets of ice that we often talk about, covered North America, the Greenland, Northern Europe. That period, that epoch, ended about 11,500 years ago as we began the current epoch that we're in now, which is called the Holocene. However, when we go from one epoch to another, it's not a clean break. There's a transition period, there's a buffer between the two, and that buffer is the mystery that helps us to understand what happened in these ancient civilizations. Between 12,800 years ago and 11,600 years ago, that little window of time is an extraordinary period of time that geologists call the Younger Dryas. There are plant species that only exist in cold one of those plants is called the Dryas, and this is where the term, the Younger Dryas, comes from. There is evidence of the Younger Dryas far down into North America and down into Northern Europe, suggesting that these were cold temperatures during this period of time, and when the temperatures began to warm, the plants disappear from that period of time. In the late Pleistocene, the time of the ice, the ice age peaked about 20,000 years before present, and the temperatures began to warm, the warming melted the ice. Then something happened that is a mystery to this day. The warming stopped, and all of a sudden, the temperatures dropped. They plunged about five degrees Celsius over the entire Northern Hemisphere. And in that shift, the temperatures plunged for a period of time, about 1,200 years. There are many theories around what caused these drastic climate changes of the Younger Dryas period. One of the prevailing theories is named the Clovis Comet Hypothesis, claiming that fragments of a large asteroid or comet struck the planet. Another theory involves a cataclysmic event in our solar system. Currently, between Mars and Jupiter is what is referred to as the asteroid belt. Throughout antiquity, Numerous astronomers and researchers have speculated that this is a result of a previously existing planet that was destroyed. In the ancient Babylonian cuneiform text, the Enuma Elish, this watery planet described as being similar to Earth is referred to as Tiamat. Throughout history, this mysterious planet has been given other names, such as Planet V, Phaeton, Muldek, and Mulge. If there was a planet that was destroyed, could some of the debris from that massive explosion have fallen to Earth, creating massive changes to the balance of our planet? Recent evidence has revealed that Earth was hit multiple times during this period of time with something from the cosmos. It is believed to be a comet for this reason. If it were an asteroid, the asteroid would have a single impact that would be more localized. But what we're finding is that whatever it was that was coming into Earth's atmosphere 
was fragmented and it broke up and scattered across multiple continents at the same time. The mineral platinum, for example, is relatively rare on Earth, but you find it in comets. As far south as South Africa, there are remnants, fragments of platinum from this comet breakup that match those that are found in Northern Europe. A large crater has been found in Greenland for precisely the same time. So when we look at the theories of what triggered the Younger Dryas, it may be that the impact of the comet and the heat generated by that impact, thousands and thousands of degrees, created a rapid melt to cool the water in the North Atlantic. One of the things we find is that ocean levels dramatically rose from before the pre-Diluvian period of 13,000 years ago. And we know that looking at geologic and climatological records, whether or not it's ice cores, or we're looking at geologic evidence. What we find is that during this time period, we had glaciation in North America and in Europe, where we had massive ice caps. So when we combine cataclysmic events in our solar system, as mentioned in the Enuma Elish, with massive amounts of rain, as well as melting of the ice caps, all that water flooded into the ocean, raising sea levels up to 400 feet, flooding and, and submerging ancient cities and structures around the world. The Atlantic Ocean is home to the global conveyor belt. Starting from the surface water around the North Pole, this circulation system pulls water from the North Pole and cycles it all throughout the planet. So when we're looking at the mystery of the Younger Dryas, what we know for certain is that there was a dilution of fresh water and cold water that changed the thermohaline properties of the ocean conveyor of the Atlantic. We know that because of the proxies and the temperature. The mystery is what single factor or what multiple factors may have contributed to that cooling. The meltwater from North America, from the ice melting, was behind a large ice wall and the evidence shows that that ice wall broke. And when it broke, there was a tremendous onslaught of that cold water, a massive flood in a relatively short period of time. What may have triggered that could have been the impact from the comet. As the mystery continues around the origin of the deluge, what can ancient mythology tell us about the changing relationship between humans and the gods around these chaotic times. Prior to the flood, there is this global narrative that occurs, and the stories are extremely consistent regardless of the culture that you're looking at. Post-flood, it changes into more local myths, or the perspective of the myths change. In the earlier myths, it's the stories of the gods. You know, they're vying for power with each other and fighting and you're part of the action of the gods. Once the flood happens, it becomes stories of humanity and their connection to the god. And so it's just a really big change that happens. One thing that is starting to crystallize among researchers of our ancient past, especially the pre-flood times, is the number of places of temples that are rebuilt on previous temple sites. We find this in Egypt, uh, we find it at Stonehenge, and we also find it at Dwarka. And what this suggests is that the ancients knew of the original locations of temples in the pre-flood times, marked those locations, and then after the flood or after this great cataclysm, returned to, to those exact same sites. This suggests that there is something inherently special about Dwarka and some of these other sites that was known to either the, the ancient gods that inhabited it, or they passed this knowledge along to humans, prompting them to rebuild on these specific sites. We know that the Ice Age essentially ended about 12,000 BP before present. But what is often missed is that when the Ice Age ended, not only did the ice continue to melt, but there was a tremendous shift in the climate. And with a shift in global climate comes a shift in local weather. The shifts in the weather were called unsettled weather patterns that lasted approximately 4,000 years. So beginning from 12,000 years BP before present to 8,000 years BP, this was a period where Earth 
saw torrential rains in some places, extreme drought in other places. And with those torrential rains from the storms, torrential erosion that left uh, impacts and effects that we're still seeing today that impact not only archeological remains and remnants of archeological remains, but also the, the landform itself. This mysterious time in history continues to challenge mythologists, scholars, and scientists. From the erosion patterns around the Sphinx in Giza to the sunken cities off the coasts of Japan and India, water has played a major role in the evolution and destruction of civilizations on this planet. When we begin to study the sites around the world that were built before these great cataclysms, archaeologists continue to discover that they were built with a purpose that is beyond our understanding. Powerful clues point to a strong cosmic connection with the builders and the locations of these archaeological wonders, leaving behind carved connections, linking these ancient pre-Diluvian cultures from all over the planet. So this is where we get to the work of David Talbot, who noticed around the Younger Dryas period that there were some major cataclysmic electrical events going on all over the planet, that there were these plasma discharges that could be from solar flares or other form of celestial activity causing these plasma bursts throughout our atmosphere. And they noticed that in Mohenjo-Daro, they recorded those exact same shapes of those plasma bursts. And it didn't stop there. There are petroglyphs all over the world with the same exact shapes telling us that this was a worldwide plasma event that was documented and recorded by countless cultures, including the people of Easter Island in their Rongo Rongo script. We begin to look at ancient cosmology and archaeoastronomy. What we find is from the Mayans to the Egyptians, to the aboriginals in Australia, to an ancient European site, and all through Mesoamerica. There was a knowledge of our relationship to the cosmos that exceeded anything that's been known in history until the mid 20th century. Constellations feature throughout alignments with uh, ancient sites. The two go hand in hand. It was looking to the Earth for her energy system and looking to particular constellations. So I think the, the river of you know, space, if you will, the, the, the river that flows from Orion especially. Orion is the focus point here between the Milky Way and between the Celestial River. An understanding of the constellations around the planet provides solid evidence in deciphering the possible time and purpose of these sites. When modern researchers began discovering cosmic connections to powerful ancient civilizations, the evidence began guiding us to the stars as our major influence in the evolution of civilizations on this planet. As the archaeologists and scholars examine several of these sacred celestial sites around the world, there is one unifying clue that teaches us the power of interconnection. Massive stones. When we look at ancient cultures around the world, especially those that we can identify have the pre-Diluvian megalithic sophistication on those foundations, when we look at the stories that are left behind, whether or not it's written in cuneiform tablets or carried down through oral records, they all seem to tell a very similar, if not the same story of these great set of catastrophes and floods that seem to have destroyed those civilizations and left behind those megalithic foundation bases for us to find thousands and thousands of years later. Whether or not it's all the way from Asia and places in Japan, all the way across the world to Peru and Bolivia, in Egypt and Turkey, we find a very specific style of building that is present on almost always the lower levels of ancient temples and structures, where it shows a high level of sophistication that's unlike anything that's above it. Something that truly stands out with a sophistication and style that is almost perfect and something that we may not even be able to do today with the tools that we have available. Something that's so precise that some of the blocks that are in position, a human hair can't even slip between them. Comparing the pre-Diluvian construction from all over the planet not only challenges the mainstream theory of the origins of civilization, but solidifies the evidence of an interconnection of knowledge between cultures long before the Great Deluge. 
Who were these beings with this advanced building knowledge that could move these massive stones? The question is no longer if these sacred megalithic sites around the planet were built before the Great Flood. The greater mystery is, how long before the Flood were they built? In a number of myths, one of the things we find is that there's no cultural memory in humanity of how they made these megalithic structures. There's no recollection of the engineering technology that's required to create these structures and lift stones a certain way because it wasn't their technology. It was the God's technology. And so that's why we can't do it again. Etched in the human psyche are stories of struggle and pain to conquer and rule different sections of this planet. Separation, division, and control became the dominant benchmark to gauge the success of a civilization, making it easy to forget how everything is interconnected. Most Western maps have been arranged around the prime meridian, showing the Americas on the left. But as the connections between ancient civilizations become more apparent, the map must shift back to the time where the unification of the planet can be seen and felt as the one divided into the many. The ice melted, creating new islands and covering old ones. As civilization began rebuilding, the division on the planet grew stronger. Turning back our celestial clock, we discover that whatever label humanity tries to put on this deluge period in history, there are foundational story points that connect all to a very volatile time on the surface of the planet. But when the hands of time go back, to the time before the end of the world, the clues in archaeology and tales told in heroes' epic journeys around the planet show that most civilized structures eventually fall. But to uncover the fundamental ancient knowledge that ties the whole story together, the hero must return back to the foundations where the story begins. We'd like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Gaia for sharing this enlightening episode with us. For those who are intrigued and wish to explore further, a treasure trove of knowledge awaits you. Gaia offers an extensive library brimming with documentaries and series covering a wide array of fascinating topics. To embark on this journey of discovery, simply click the link in the description below. There you'll gain access to a world of profound insights and captivating content on Gaia's platform. Dive deep and let your curiosity lead the way.